a reference for our answers, which we should always do. Who did James say is blessed? Those who endure, those who persevere under trial, verse 12. And then to whom has the Lord promised a crown of life? A man, once he's been approved, verse 12, he'll receive the crown of life. Number three was what which should a man say when, uh, what should no man say rather when he is tempted? I'm being tempted by God. No man should say that. Verse 13. If I spoke over somebody, I apologize. Why should one think that God, why should one not think that God has tempted him? That's right. God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 13. And then number five, when is a person tempted? That's right. When he's carried away and enticed by his own lust, verse 15 tells us. What brings forth sin? Desire. When lust has conceived, desire. That's what brings forth sin. What brings forth death? When sin's full grown, when sin is accomplished, verse 15. Number eight, what comes down from the Father of lights? Every good thing given, every perfect gift, verse 17. Number nine, how is the steadfastness of God described? That's right, verse 17, there's no variation, there's no shifting shadow. And number 10, what did God, with what did God beget us? The word of truth, verse 18. So now the true or false, we can blame God when bad things happen to us. I'd probably word that one a little bit differently just based upon what we're talking about here in the context. We can blame God when we're tempted by evil. Uh, is, is that a true or, or false statement? That's false. Either way, it's false. Uh, verse 13 tells us that when we're tempted, we're not being tempted by God. And God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But when we wanna, if we want to look at it from the standpoint of we can blame God when bad things happen to us, that also is false. What does blame mean? Got the definition there. Blame assigns guilt for wrongdoing. That's what blame is. When you're blaming somebody, you're assigning guilt to them as having done something wrong, being the source of the wrong. And so when we blame God, when bad things happen to us, we're blaming him, saying that he did something wrong. We talked a little bit about this last week. I don't think we actually turned over and read it. But in Job, that's exactly what we see happening in Job when he is being tried. Uh, Job does phenomenally well uh, through so much, but yet Job uh, blames God. We see that in chapter 19 and verse 6. He says, Know then that God has wronged me and has closed his net around me. God has wronged me. What's he doing? He's blaming God for what's happening in his life. He's accusing God of doing wrong, of being unjust. And then in chapter 40 and verse 8, God responds to Job, none too kindly, for the blame that Job places upon him. In verse 8, he says, Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? So when we seek to blame God, whether it's dealing with when we're tempted to sin, or whether we blame God when bad things are happening in our lives, when there's trials, tribulations, what we're doing is we're, we are uh, accusing God of wrongdoing. And we should never do that. Any questions, any comments on that one? Number two says, temptations occur when we are drawn away by our lust. True or false? True. Verse 14 tells us that. Temptations can work for our good. 
That's true. Verse 2 through 3, that's what we've been talking about. Consider it a joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That sounds like something working for our good, doesn't it? And verse 12 says that a man is to, uh, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Temptations can work for our good. Trials can work for our good. We talked about temptation being a form of trial. Number four, James admonishes brethren, do not err. It's true. Uh, King James says, do not err. The New King James, the English Standard, the NASB says, do not be deceived. So, do not err. Do not be deceived. There's a lot of ways that we deceive ourselves, especially concerning this particular topic at hand. We talked about that last week. When tempted to sin, we have no choice but to comply. That's false. I don't know that we actually covered this verse in our study, so I'll turn over there and read it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 13, I think tells us that this is a false statement. When we're tempted to sin, we have no choice to, but to comply. That's false because Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. This is the same word that we've been talking about in the Greek, parasmos or parazos. Uh, we can back up to verse 6, and we see that the context here is, is, is temptation. He says, now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. There's that lust, that desire, that longing, that craving. And so he tells us in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But also with the temptation, he'll provide the way to escape so that you will be able to endure it. You going to say something, Brother Duff? That's one of my favorite verses. It has been for about 15 years. Every time I'm learning the quotation, I'm going to read it back to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we, need to, we need to keep that in mind at all times, no matter how alluring. That temptation is. There's a way to escape it. No matter how hard, how difficult it may be, there's a way to escape it. It's not more than we can bear. We don't have to sin. And each and every opportunity that we are confronted with sin or a temptation to sin, we have the option not to sin. And we have the promise here that God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able and that he'll also provide a way of, of escape. So, false. When we're tempted to sin, we have no choice but to comply. Research. Find the verse that says, All things work together for good to them that love the Lord or love God. Where is that? Romans 8 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We talked about that in our study last week. That when it says that every good thing given, every perfect gift, verse 17, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Thought question. Since we're begotten by the word of truth, verse 18, how is this involved with baptism and being born again? And he asks us to compare John 3, verse 5, that says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say, and, or say to you, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And in 1 Peter 1, says, Since we have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. And then finally, Ephesians 5, verse 26 says, So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her from the washing of water with the word. So, short of writing a thesis, this is, my, this is my answer. Obedience to the truth, the imperishable seed, the word of God, those are all descriptions that we read in 1 Peter 1, or it's called the word of truth here in James 1.18. It's described as being born again. We read that in John 3 and 1 Peter 1. Or as being begat or brought forth. That's what we read in James 1 verse 18. So, obedience to the word requires being born of water in the spirit, or the washing of water, Ephesians 5, verse 26, which both refer to water baptism. 
So that's how we tie all those things together. That's how all those verses fit together. And there's a dozen others that we could look at that convey similar thoughts concerning uh, this topic of how we're begotten by the word of truth and what that means. How does that connect to being born again? How does that connect to being baptized? Any questions, any comments, any statements that anybody would like to make? So this morning, we're ready to move into the next section here, which I call proving ourselves doers, because I think that's one of the major themes here. Uh, and, and I've got that running all the way through uh, chapter three, really. But all these things we're going to look at here, it, it falls under the idea of not just being hearers, not enough just to hear the truth, we've got to do the truth. And so the first thing he talks about here in verses 19 through 25 is humbly receiving the word. And we talked about how that in our introduction to this book, that James is a, is a book of, of imperatives, of authoritative commands. And we said that some 54 commands are given in about 108 verses. So about every two verses, we have a command. And some of these commands are very difficult. Uh, we talked about in verse 2 that considering it all joy when we encounter various trials is difficult. That's not easy. Something that produces sorrow, something that produces pain and affliction and suffering. Very hard to consider that a joy in the moment. But we talked about how we can achieve that and, and what is meant by that. Well, here's another one of those hard commands beginning in verse 19. He says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So the first thing we see here is he says, this you know. You know this, my beloved brethren. It reminds me of the statement that Peter makes in first, or 2 Peter 3, verse 1, when he says, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. You know, there's rarely a topic, a lesson, a study that we hear that, that we haven't heard before, that we don't already know. But the reason we go over it is as a form of reminder. Now, it's not to say that somebody can approach something slightly different or bring something out that maybe we haven't thought before or thought of before. That, that certainly can happen. But most things we're aware of, most things we know. John, when he was writing in his epistles, he says, I'm writing to you not because you don't know, but because you do know. And James says, you, this you know, my beloved brethren. So the following exhortations are prevalent in the scriptures. We're going to look at a lot of them. We're going to go back over to Proverbs and we're going to look at some, some exhortations concerning anger, concerning holding our tongue, concerning listening and hearing. So it's true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. And in, in a sense, what he says here in verse 19 about being slow to hear, or excuse me, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to aim, you know, in a lot of ways, that's common sense, isn't it? But it's easily forgotten. And it's even more difficult to practice these things. And so he says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must. So the following statements are not merely suggestions. You know, this isn't like, uh, you know, you read a self-help book and, and the author provides some suggestions for how to deal with certain situations or events in your life. No, these are commands. How we ought to behave. Not just how, you know, uh, how we must act. This is how we must behave. And so the context of these statements are with regard to humbly receiving the word of God. That's what we read there in verse 21. So he makes these statements, and then in verse 21 he says, Therefore, in light of these things, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted. 
But these things here that he speaks of in verse 19 concerning being quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, I, I can't think of an application, a situation where these don't apply. Conversations that we have with our wife, with our children, with our boss, with a stranger on the street, with our brethren, and certainly when it comes to dealing with the Word of God. I just can't think of a situation where we can say, oh, no, that doesn't apply. I, no, you don't have to be quick to hear. You don't have to be slow to anger. No, it's okay to get quick to No, there's not a situation where these things really don't apply. And I hope we see that as we go through these verses. So he says, the first thing he says is be quick to hear. So the word that's translated quick is the Greek word takos. It means fleet. That is figuratively prompt. Or ready, so being ready to hear is the idea of what we're we're talking about here. The idea of ready to hear is really to listen, to understand, and that's the way this same exact word that is translated here in this passage is translated in Mark four verse three as listen, and, and in First Corinthians fourteen verse two, Paul says understand. So we see here that hearing isn't just the physical act of hearing, it's listening to understand. We can hear things all day long. We can hear every word a person says, but we haven't really listened to what they said, and we haven't really understood what they said, but we heard every word they said. So there's a difference between just hearing and comprehending. And so the idea here is that we need to be quick to listen, listen to understand what is being said. So listening, understanding is essential, we know, when it comes to God's Word because that's where faith comes from. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So hearing is essential when it comes to God's Word. You know, far too often we don't truly listen to what is being said because we're distracted. How many times has that happened to you? Somebody is talking to you, somebody is asking you questions, somebody is telling you things, or telling you things, and... They get done and it just didn't register. We heard them, but it didn't register what they, what they were saying. Sometimes when I'm sitting here studying for the lesson, one of the kids will come up to me and say something and I hear them speak, but when they're done, I don't know what they said. I haven't truly listened. I heard, but I didn't listen. So a lot of times the reason why is because we're distracted. I think we have an excellent example of, of this very thing occurring in Luke chapter 10. Beginning in verse 38, he says, Now when they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her, tell, then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Martha has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now I realize here that, that Martha is not sitting at Jesus' feet listening and just distracted. Martha is distracted going about trying to take care of, of, of lunch or dinner and the things of hospitality. But the same is true sometimes when we're, we're in a conversation, when we're in a discussion. We're not listening to what's being said because in our minds we are distracted. What are we distracted with? The worries. We're worried and bothered about so many things. There's something else in our minds. Somebody's talking to us, but we're not really registering what they're saying because in our minds we're distracted. So far too often we don't truly listen because we're distracted. And in discussions, we may be too preoccupied thinking about our response or our rebuttal. And we shouldn't be doing that. We need to be listening. We need to be quick to hear. Turn over with me to Proverbs. If you have a, a marker, you may want to place it here because we're going to be turning back and forth quite a bit this morning. But in Proverbs 18, verse 2, he says, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. When we are in a discussion with somebody, Say it's about the Word of God. We're in a discussion, and they're, they're, they're making their point. They're talking. 
but we're not really hearing what they're saying. In our minds, we're thinking about what am I going to say when I get to speak? What am I going to say when he hushes? What's my rebuttal going to be to what he's saying right now? And instead of listening to what's being said, we're thinking of what we're going to say. And what does Solomon say? He says, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. If I'm sitting here thinking about what am I going to say when he gets done talking, I'm not listening to understand. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I want to reveal my mind. And then down in verse 13, he says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. In order to truly answer somebody, I need to be listening to what they're saying. Not just hearing it, but listening to understand what they're saying. And then and only then can I truly give an answer because only then have I heard what it was they had to say. And he says, if I don't do this, he says, it's a folly. It's foolishness. It's a shame to me to answer somebody without listening to what they're saying. So don't be too preoccupied thinking about your response, thinking about your rebuttal. Be quick to hear. Listen. Make sure you're understanding what's being said. So many times in life, if you've ever witnessed people communicate, a lot of times at work and meetings through the years, I have seen people argue with each other and they both were saying the same thing, but neither one of them listened long enough to understand that they were saying the same thing just in different ways. They both were just intent on getting their point across. Talking past each other is what I call that. Both saying the same thing, saying it slightly different ways, but the, the ultimate, what they're trying to say is, is really the same, but they're not listening. And we need to be careful not to do that. So being quick to hear requires discipline. In Proverbs chapter 10, and in verse 19, it says, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. We need to be quick to hear. And so in order to be quick to hear, we must restrain our lips. You know, I, I can't stand shows on television, whether it's these talk shows that come on daytime TV or whether it's these political shows that come on CNN and Fox where people are just talking over each other the whole time. Just like, you know, if I yell a little bit louder, you'll listen to me. You'll get, you know, my point will be much, you know, that much better if I just yell a little bit louder and talk over you. Well, we need to restrain our lips and we need to be quick to hear, to listen, to understand. That takes discipline, because that's what he says here. Restrain, <laughs> restrain our lips, bite our tongues, hold back. That takes discipline. It takes concentration. In Second Peter, <clears throat> in Second Peter chapter one, and in verse nineteen. He says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Speaking here concerning the word of God, concerning the prophetic word, which is made more sure, he says, to which you would do well to pay attention. When it comes to receiving the word of God, we need to pay attention to the word of God. And the same thing is true in our, com in our conversations and in our discussions, especially if we're debating a, a Bible topic, a Bible subject. We need to make sure that we concentrate to understand what the other person is saying. We need to make sure we pay attention to the Word of God. Focus upon it. Concentrate upon it. And when somebody is, is talking, we need to concentrate on what they're saying so that we understand what it is they're saying. And then and only then can we truly address it or answer it. And it also requires humility. Here in James, in our text, in verse 21, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted. When it comes to God's word, we need to humble ourselves. When it comes to conversation and discussion, especially when it gets contentious, we need to humble ourselves. We need to be quick to hear. Job chapter 34, this is when, you remember Job's 
friends come to comfort him, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. And for most uh, or a good portion of the book, it's their responses to Job and Job's responses to them that, that we are considering. But finally, there's a young man by the name of Eliphaz who speaks up. If I can ever find the passage, I keep flipping past it. Who speaks up, and he, he probably speaks more wisdom than all three of Job's other friends combined in honesty. But this is when Eliphaz is, is speaking, and he says in chapter 34 and in verse 32, he says, teach me, back up to verse 31, for it, has anyone said to God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend anymore, teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will not do it again. Remember his other friends accused him of evil doing, Job, you must have done something wrong, and God is punishing you, Job. And you need to just fess up and admit that you've done wrong, and, and Job maintains his innocence. Rightly so. What we read in chapter 1, he's, he's done nothing wrong. That's not the reason he's being tried. He's being tried because he's a good man. None like him in all the earth. But he says here, you know, has anybody ever stopped to say, you know, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend anymore. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will not do it again. What's he telling him? He's saying, humble yourself. Just, you know, God, if, 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 if you are punishing me because I've done something, please reveal to me what it is that I've done so that I will do it no more. And when it comes to God's word and a study of God's word, when it comes to receiving the word of God, we need to humble ourselves. We need to have this attitude, teach me what I do not see. If I've done iniquity, I'll do it. I won't do it again. That needs to be our attitude. What is that? It's an attitude of humility. And in conversation and in discussion, we need to have an attitude of humility. We need to be listening to understand what the other person's saying. Have that attitude of you may be right. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to consider what you have to say. I'm going to weigh it against the Word of God. That needs to be our attitude, an attitude of humility. So being quick to hear requires discipline, concentration, and humility. Probably a lot of other things too. But those are three that, that stood out to me. And then he goes on, he says, slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. The Greek word here is bratus. William Mount says it means not hasty. So not hasty to speak. Not, in other words, to be slow to speak means not to be hasty to speak. So to be ready to listen, to understand, and not hasty to speak implies, in my opinion, that we should pause and reflect and consider what has been said. I'm going to be quick to hear. It's to listen, to understand. And then I'm to be slow to speak. You know, a lot of times we don't like air in the conversation. And, and, and so we immediately, you know, they get done talking, we immediately open our mouths. I used to have a school teacher who said, be, he said, be sure you load your brain before you shoot your mouth. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. And in order to do that, sometimes I just need to pause. To reflect, to consider what's been said. Maybe I need to ask a question or two. Is this what you said? I think this is what you said. Could you confirm that this is what you said? Is this what you meant by that? So we need to be quick to hear. We need to be slow to speak. And so I think that implies that we need to reflect, that we need to consider what has been said. Turn to 2 Timothy. Paul tells Timothy several things here in this passage that he needs to do. But then in verse 7, he says, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy, stop and think about it. Consider it. Ponder it. Roll it around in your mind. And he tells him that God will give him understanding in everything. And if we go to God's Word, the same is true for us. God will give us understanding in everything. If we lack wisdom, James says in verse 4, we need to pray to God in faith, and he'll, he'll give us that wisdom. God will give us understanding and everything, but I need to stop and consider it, to think about it, to ponder it. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we know that the Bereans were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures to see whether the things being said were so. That term, fair-minded. So a lot, most translations use the term noble-minded, but in that word is the idea of generosity. So we need to be generous. We need to be fair. 
when we're considering something. We need to consider what someone has to say. We need to weigh it fairly, not just, oh, that's not, you know, that, I don't believe that. Weigh it, consider it. They were fair-minded because they received the word that was being spoken, but they compared it to the Scriptures. It also implies, I believe, that we thoughtfully choose how to reply. Be quick to hear, be slow to speak. So we thoughtfully choose how do we reply, or even if we should reply. And let's talk more about that. Turn back over to Proverbs chapter 10 and look at verse 19 beginning. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. So here again is this idea of restraining ourselves, restraining our lips. That's the idea of being slow to speak. And he says, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Why is that? It's because we say the right things. We pause. We're not hasty to speak. We think about what's being said and we consider how we should respond. We'll talk more about that in a moment when we get over to Ephesians chapter 4. But then turn to chapter 15 and verse 28. He says, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. How does he do that? Because he's slow to speak. He's quick to hear. He's slow to speak. He ponders how it is he should answer. Turn over to chapter 17, verse 27, beginning. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered prudent. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just need to be quiet. Sometimes we don't just need to spout off at the mouth because it reveals our foolishness. And he says, even a fool, if he keeps his mouth shut, looks wise. But he says, he who restrains his words has knowledge. He who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. You know, that's in the context here. We haven't got to that part yet. But along with being quick to hear and slow to speak, we're to be slow to anger. And so when I say... We need to consider how to reply and whether we should even reply is what I'm saying is, is that if, you know, if our spirit's not real cool, if we feel that heat building up inside us, that heat of anger, we would do ourselves well. Just don't speak. Don't talk. Wait. <laughs> Wait until you can calm down and talk reasonably and rationally. Don't let your lips fly when you're angry. And that's what he's telling us here in this passage. Turn it over to the New Testament, to 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice verse 14 beginning. He says, But if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We need to always be ready to give an answer about our faith, about our belief based upon the Word of God. But notice the second half of that sentence is that we need to do it with gentleness and reverence. And if my face is red and my eyes are bugging out and the spit's coming out of my mouth because I'm so angry and I'm so fired up, then I'm not gentle. <laughs> and I'm not doing so reverently. And so we need to think about that. We need to consider that. And if we don't think we can answer calmly and coolly and collectedly, then maybe we just don't need to answer at all in that moment. Ephesians, or excuse me, yeah, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 
Ephesians 4 and verse 29. He says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. What is edification? The building up. According to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So when we pause to reflect what to say, how we respond, we need to do so, as he says here, so that it will only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that you will not, or rather, so that you, it will give grace to those who hear. Are words said in anger gracious? Are words said in anger edifying? No, they're, they're tearing down. And so we need to consider these things in our reply. So be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. And now we're going to talk about being slow to anger on the next chart, but this final point, remember... We don't learn from talking. We learn from listening. And in Proverbs 18, verse 15, the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Notice it doesn't say the mouth of the wise, the ear. The ear of the wise. That's the only way we learn is by listening. Be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. And then finally, be slow to anger. Again, this word slow is the Greek word bradus, meaning not hasty. Don't be hasty to anger. It's possible to be angry without sinning. That's what we read here in Ephesians chapter 4. If we back up a few verses to verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. Talked last week about, you know, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to act on the temptation. It's not a sin to be angry. We're told that here in this passage. But it's headed down the path. He goes on, he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I think that's the idea of not letting things fester and stew because that's where we get bitterness, that's where we get resentment. We harbor grudges and ill will against people because we don't resolve the issue. But notice what he says in verse, 28, or verse 27. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27, do not give the devil an opportunity. Anger is one of those states where we are giving the devil an opportunity. We're giving him inroads. We're giving him a path to tempt us to sin. To say things, to do things that we shouldn't do because we've lost control because we're angry. So it's possible to be angry. Angry is an emotion that we all experience in a variety of different ways. Just because we're angry don't mean we've sinned. It's what we do with that anger that causes sin. But we, I want us to notice that it's giving the devil an opportunity. We need to be careful. So we need to be slow to anger. Don't, don't be hasty to get angry. Being quick to anger shows our foolishness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9, Solomon says, The end of a matter, or no, that's verse 8, verse 9, do not be eager in your heart to be angry. For anger resides in the bosom of fools. What do you see when you look out in the world today? You see a lot of angry people, don't you? We see these news clips of road rage. We, see the, we hear these stories about people going in and shooting up their school, shooting up their job site. What is that? That's, that's anger. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. As Christians, we should not be fools. And if we have anger, lots of anger in our bosom, and we let it fester, and we, we always harbor these feelings of resentment, it makes us foolish. It shows our foolishness. In Proverbs chapter 12 and in verse 16, there he says, A fool's anger is known at once but a prudent man conceals dishonor. Again, it's okay to feel anger, but we don't have to let everybody know it. We've got to restrain it. We've got to keep it. We've got to control it. Sir, yes, sir. John chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord turned loose on us. He made a whip of Jesus also walked on water. <laughs> and so 
A lot of people point to that verse and say it's okay to get angry, but Jesus had something that we didn't have. He had perfect control of His Spirit. And so I would never recommend that we start driving people out with a cord and flipping tables because get out of hand on us real quick. Jesus was in control of His Spirit. So we need to keep that in mind and not use that example to say, well, it's okay for me to fly off the hand. It's, yeah. Right. Right. God got angry. God was wroth throughout the Old Testament. And we see what God did because of it. God is just. The problem with you and me sometimes is that we're not always just. And we'll talk about that in another chart, that a lot of anger, the source of it is not righteousness, it's pride. Pride is the source of a lot of human anger. The anger of man does not achieve, he says in the next verse, the righteousness of God. And that's the problem that you and I have, is that our anger sometimes is based in our pride and our ego and not in the righteousness of God. But Proverbs 15, verse 18, he says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. You ever seen a calm man in practice? It's a beautiful thing to behold. I've been in meetings before where I thought people were going to, you know, rip each other's throats out of their neck. They were just angry with each other. And a calm man would speak up and he would just diffuse the situation. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. The slow to anger calms the dispute. Chapter 19, verse 19. He says, a man of great anger will bear the penalty. How true that is. He goes on and says... For if you rescue him, you'll only have to do it again. Why? Because he's out of control. It's his anger that's controlling him. He's not thinking rationally. His anger is leading him to do the things that he does. So being quick to anger shows our foolishness. Being slow to anger shows our wisdom. Here in Proverbs, again, back up to chapter 14 and notice verse 29. Proverbs are full of this. These are just a handful of the passages that deal with this idea of anger. Proverbs 14, verse 29 says, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. When we're slow to anger, we're demonstrating our great understanding. But when we are quick to anger, we're showing our foolishness. Chapter 16, and verse 23, The heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. I don't know if that was the verse I was going for, but it's a good verse. The heart of the wise instructs his mouth. James chapter 3, back where we are in the context here, a couple chapters over in verse 13. The word anger is not mentioned, but notice what he says. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. You want to know how to show your wisdom? Show your gentleness. Show your calmness. Don't show your anger. A man who is hasty to get angry, a man who is quick to anger is a fool. And we need not be that way. We're going to run out of time here. So it might ought to be good for us just to stop, but we'll get as far as we can. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Anger leads to hatred. That's the problem. Anger leads to hatred. Hatred is ill will. It's indignation. It's resentment. That's the definition of hatred. Hatred, ill will, indignation, resentment, a desire to injure. What does that do? That leads to murder. And you say, well, I'm not that angry. (laughs) I'm not angry enough to kill anybody. A lot of people in this world are, but you know, we say, I'm not going to kill anybody. But what do we see in the scriptures? We'll read these passages next Sunday, but in Matthew chapter five, what do we see? He says, you've heard you shouldn't commit murder, but I say to you, don't be angry with your brother. What does anger lead to? It leads to calling names. It leads to resentment and ill will. And Jesus says that's murder. In John chapter 1, verse, or John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, he who hates his brother is a murderer. So we'll pick up there next week.